and without a microphone, if you prefer that, whatever you do. Should it be really without microphone? Yes. Otherwise, just move a little bit nearer, please. <laughs> I think this is a nuisance. Okay, thank you very much. Right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad you've come back again for the last one. I'll try to be a bit shorter today. I, I, I took more than my time in the previous two classes uh, so that we have a few questions uh, or question time afterwards to round up and finalize. Um, today I'm going to talk about what I call here linguistic evidence in the study of Khoikhoi origins. In other words, how is linguistics involved in that? Now, in 1668, again, we are back in those times of the boats that went up the west coast and so on. This was 16 years after van Riebeck's time. And after van Riebeck had left, he was here only for 10 years. Can you hear me at the back? Yes. OK. Um, the first more elaborate accounts of the Cape Koi were published. There were these books, the one by Alfred Dapper in 1668, Kafrarie of Lanter Hottentots. That was part of a book, Nalkeurige Beschrijvingen der Afrikaanse Gewesten. Interesting also that it, Southern Africa is then called Kafrarie. You see that word again. Certainly not demeaning demeaningly intended, it was the term used in those days. Uh, the other one by Willem ten Reiner, uh, this is a translation uh, from Latin. Uh, account of the Cape of Good Hope and of the Hottentots who inhabit that region. Those were the first books that were available and which were a little more elaborate. Uh, Tapper's book is a, I must admit, I have not looked again at it now. I saw, looked at it years ago. It was republished and so on. But it is a compilation of information from other authors, but it is supposed to be well researched and therefore a worthwhile source of information. Now, when we talk about this transition from so called, I say so called prehistory, to history, and I must explain what that is. Prehistory was the history when there were no written records. And there was some European, I would say, chauvinism that there were historians who claimed that unless you had written records, it was no history. So history only started with books like this, according to those people. In fact, it was in. Um, uh, very recently, now in the, uh, towards the end of the 20th century, that a professor at the University of London still said, and I quote, no history before the coming of Europeans. History only begins when men take to writing. Oh, wow. So um, this is the so-called prehistory. But that is where we come in as linguists and all the other disciplines to establish what happened, because we have no written documents to go by, right? Um, in other words, uh, the ethnographic present is done by written documents, starting with things like this. But the prehistory needs the interdisciplinary investigation by various sciences like archaeology, anthropology, um, and Last but not least, linguistics. I'm not talking about serogenetics yet. That's a very modern recent science, OK? And they have to, to, to try to puzzle together this mosaic and find what corroborates the information of the other discipline and what perhaps is not compatible and so on. This is where academic discussions are about. So anthropology and archaeology include um Rock and uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, this is uh, rock art, all that, you know. And yesterday, sorry, I, I did not think of that. Of course, when we came to written documents that you asked, of course, rock engravings are written documents, right? Um, apart also from the oral history, which I'm not going to talk about today, all right? Um, that's 
That's something with pros and cons, but uh, it certainly must not be ignored, certainly for hints. Uh, it was too long, but I had hints here of, of uh, oral comments which are followed up. If you want to, you can say Pastor Isaac's memory of this word Kwekogoba that his grandmother used in the 1920s was kind of oral history, and I followed up and I could verify it, right? This is the kind of uh, cooperation that you need. Right. Um, so serogenetics came in only in the last 20 to 30 years or so, and it very much takes over now where linguistic investigation will come to an end. I want to demonstrate this today, and I want to pull some strings together of the things that you hopefully have, uh, that you hopefully remember from the last two classes, uh, that you have the background, and we now see where it starts making sense. Um, just a comment here by Rainer Fossen, the Khoisanes, the the best, the most prominent uh, pupil of uh, Oswin Köhler. He's also retired now. He wrote when he was busy with his his uh, habilitation, his PhD, second PhD on the Khoi languages of Southern Africa. He wrote in an article there for Africa the significance of linguistic research for ethno-historical reconstruction can nowhere be estimated higher than in the Khoisan speaking area. It is a really interesting area of uh, investigation. Uh, I want to just give you another quote by uh, Kizerbo, who's written a series of books on African history. And he says, uh, 1981, and I quote, linguistics today is a discipline that has attained a degree of accuracy sufficient for it to be used for diagnosing the past. That's linguistics. The corollary of that is, unless you investigate languages, in our case, Khoi and San languages, uh, with rigorous linguistic analysis that is accountable, and unless you do languages with the same kinds of methodology, you cannot use it to investigate history. So you must investigate the languages first, then you can start with the historical investigation. You didn't give the, the name of the, the person who wrote it down? Kiza, uh, that's uh, Kizerbo. Kizerbo, okay. Yeah, it's K-I-Z-E-R-B-O. It's uh, J. Kizerbo. Sorry for this, I have not got my footnotes here with the full references. Kizerbo. Yeah. But just Google his name and you'll find it's a whole series of books on African history. Um, of these Khoisan languages, you now know what Khoisan is, non-bantu click, uh, non click language of Southern Africa. Khoikogoa uh, is arguably amongst the Khoisan languages that has been investigated most comprehensively to meet these requirements. Um, this achievement is not an achievement, I'm not praising myself or anybody recent for that, it is the, an achievement that started with the pioneers in the 19th century, those missionaries like Grönland and so on, who wrote those first grammars, who developed that language, we would today say, who started empowering the language, literally. And uh, so Nama, as it was called then, uh, is, is a, was developed as a written language. It is today the only Khoisan language which is used as medium of instruction in the primary school, lower primary school in Namibia, and as subject from grade one to grade 12. It's a, you can take it as one of the metric languages. And just to finish my sentence, and it is a university subject, a degree major in, at uh, the University of Namibia. Yes, please. If it's questions, not opinions, okay? That's <laughs> a question. Does the Gua have a specific, what does that mean on its own? Govap means not Govap. It's not English W, Govap. Govap. It means language. language. That's just the word for language. So Koi Koi Govap means Koi Koi language. <laughs> Therefore, it is, uh, would be tautologist to speak of a Koi Koi Govap language. language. Right? Okay. Just say Koi Koi language. And for short, 
When I speak, I refer to the language, I, will, I just say Koipo, because it's a bit long. All right? Good. Now, um, I want to come to linguistic evidence, and first of all, to the principles of the um, comparative historical method that is used to investigate languages in the so-called prehistory when we have no written documents. There are a few assumptions, some of which seem to be so obvious that we overlook them. The main assumption in this prehistorical investigation is that languages can be related to former societies and cultures. So if we can trace the history of the development of the language, we can at the same time trace at least considerable parts of the history of the speakers of that language, where they migrated from, where they started. Uh, just as an example, this is why today it is generally agreed that those 500 plus Bantu languages, you now know what Bantu means, mm -hmm. they all came from the area in Cameroon, in the bend of West Africa. Earlier there were uh, ideas that they came from East Africa and so on, but there is linguistic evidence that traces them back to, to Nigeria, Cameroon, that area there. So, um, languages are related to societies and to their cultures. And um, now, to investigate these matters, these historic matters, you have a discipline of linguistics which is called comparative linguistics. And uh, these languages can be said to be genetically related. We're not talking about serogenetics now, not about mitochondrial DNA and so on, all right? We are just talking, you know, where we had these trees showing the structures. I'll show you so one just now. Serolinguistics, how do you spell it? Serogenetics. No. Zero means from serum, blood serum, S-E-R-O, genetics. And I'm not talking about that now when I said they are genetically related. This means via the, the method that I want to demonstrate in its basics just now, that they come from the same ancestral language, the ancestral language which we call a proto-language. And that was the big issue. Uh, Lampers like Köhler and, uh, of course, um, Bloomberg first, they said that the Khoi and the San languages all go back to the same ancestral language. And Westphal said you cannot prove that. I, I'm getting into that now. Right. Um, in other words, if you have genetic classification, linguistic classification, it establishes, it, it gives you the uh, ability to relate present day languages, whether they are related or not. I mean, very easy if you remember that example of the word for person in Bantu, all based on du, a Bantu, and so on. And you, if you compare it to koi, koi, koi kogoba, there I have to use the word already, it's koi, that's a totally different word, mm -hmm. so they would not be related, right? Because how otherwise would koi kogoba come to that other word? Right. Now, this linguistic reconstruction, as I already indicated with the boundary examples, gives you the possibility to establish the approximate location of the original languages. Um, we can't go into detail here, of course, there's no time for that. But um, when you retrace these locations, you can make assumptions about prehistoric migrations I mean, how did the Bantu get from Cameroon to South Africa? And uh, then also you see contact situations between languages. And when you have contexts, you will have loan words, that kind of stuff. This is why the study of loan words is so important. I'll come to some examples just now. Uh, Professor, uh, something that I find very strange in the translation of the setting of languages is that there's so many about out here in the southern part of Africa concerning the Khoi and the Sam. However, it is assumed that the migration started from the north and that eventually the Khoi and Sam found themselves in the south. Yet, if you look at the far part, right up to just in one of our ambassadors to uh, Zambia, and he found the part of the Khoi and and I find it strange, uh, how do we justify saying that 
the migration started from the north being in the north, is so is less of art than what we have here in the south. Um, I must refer you to archaeologists like Lewis Williams or so. <laughs> I'm an absolute amateur when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably know more about it than I do, so I'm afraid I cannot give you a knowledgeable answer about that. Thanks. Okay. Right. Now, um, I mentioned already that this comparative method was developed by the philologists in the, in the 19th century. You didn't speak of linguistics, you spoke of philology because it was very, very much also always in... Uh, uh, it, uh, they refer to philosophical ideas about languages, Humboldt, and all that. This, this is the philosophical, uh, the philological side. Now, comparative philology of the 19th century, I told you, was interested in establishing Indo-Germanic, where they had written documents, uh, or, and then not just Indo-European, uh, Indo-Germanic, but bringing it right back to the all out ancestral language, Proto-Indo-European. That is where these me methodologies were uh, developed, but they had to be adapted then, in the time of Blick and Lepsius and so on, to languages that had no written de documents. In other words, it became a hypothetical uh, method where they had to make derivations about the probable shape and the genetic interrelation of languages in the past. And I said also this is considered to be one of the major intellectual achievements of the 19th century to establish this method for non-written languages. Now, I just want to come to this comparative method quickly so that we can get on there. Um, the, this comparative method examines sets of words with the same meaning from languages to determine whether they are related or not. Just to give you an example here. Um, sets of words, all right, they are related by the meaning. In other words, here if we take a word for hunger, I've taken Bantu languages because Bantu languages are so clearly uh, retraceable to a proto-language, so it's easiest to, or nicest, to demonstrate it from there. There you have Oshindonga Otiherero from uh, Namibia, but one from further away, Kiswahili. If you take the word for hunger in Oshindonga, Onjala, Panjara, Kiswahili, Nja, okay, maybe that doesn't sound too similar. Let's look at male. Lume, Rume, Ume, to stay somewhere. Okukala, Kara, Ka, Path, Onjila, Onjila, Onjia. I think you can see where it goes. You have your sets of words here. The set is just consists of three words with the same meaning which combines, which links them for investigation. And then if you see regularities of sounds here, um, then you, the more you have, the more evidence, the stronger your case is. Then you know that these languages must be related. Well, I'm sure I've already highlighted this for you with red. You can see what is L in Oshindonga, always is always R in Oshi Herero and is always what in Kiswahili? Okay. Deleted. Nothing there. Right? This was Jada, Jada, something like that, but a consonant got lost here. Right? And all of them, none of the words in Kiswahili have the consonants that they have here. So from that, if you have this regularity, you can re-establish a common form which is a kind of a formula to, to just to identify the set here in this case, for instance, and it's usually marked with an asterisk. That means it's a theoretical form. You cannot prove that it ever existed because you have no written documents and no tape recordings, for that matter. So you make up a word and you put in any kind of symbol for that consonant in question. De is simply here, this is not for phonetic reasons because it's an alveolar sound, you, the tip of your tongue touches behind the teeth and so on. And uh, 
further document, uh, um, uh, criteria which you get for more languages. We don't go into that. You could also put in a number. You could say uh, correspondence number one or so, but that is mentally not so good to remember. So you put in sounds like that. So you can come to a formula like that. You call it common Bantu. This idea comes from a British Bantuist, Malcolm Guthrie, who developed common Bantu and Proto Bantu. He was at the School of Oriental African Studies. Westphal and he were colleagues when Westphal was still there before he came to UCT, so Westphal was really offended with his method, and he hammered me with it also. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so here, whatever is an L in Oshindonga, you can expect to be an R in Herero if the correspondence is regular, and it will be zero in Kiswahili. Now, you just find a common symbol to to, to identify this uh, set, well, call it asterisk D, right? That's what the principle works like. Um, and if they are related like this, you can work all the words cognate, that is just a term. Yes, sorry? No, I just say it's interesting enough, it's the same in Kimoranda, the L R. Yeah, but well, then you know the language is probably a Bantu language. Yeah, yeah. Yes? I don't know if I'm correct, maybe. Uh, Doctor Aiken, but uh, if you could go back to the previous slide, okay. the so-called Bantu languages mm -hmm. and, and common knowledge. Um, we don't have any Buni, and Buni is one of the big Bantu groups in South Africa. It's in a group. Africa. It's a group. <laughs> yeah, and Buni people. Zulu, Swazi, Kosa. I don't see the Buni there. No. I mean the common Bantu because they also regard this Bantu in Look, when, when, I, when I compiled this, I was away on a holiday. I had no library accessible, oh, just, right? So I didn't put in South African language. Please excuse uh, that. Yeah, because uh, the Nguni is quite a big group in Africa. Sure. Uh, like they also do in the same area, for instance, and they like a big yeah. Yeah. conglomeration of. Yes. Like you have the Sutu languages, which are northern Sutu yeah. Sapedi, yeah, you know, yeah, you know, yeah. Sutu Saburwa, yes. and Sitswana. Also, so, yeah. so what do you call yes. the Herero and Kuchibanga? What do you call those? No, like they them? don't form a group like don't that. Form a group. No. Sorry, your hand was up there. I just like to clarify. You know that the origin was, as you said, in central. Africa, not the Central African Republic. And I just like to take three words which which you can add to the list. And the one is brain. Brain in uh, Ovango is Mbuna. Brain in Herero is Mbuna. Mbura. Brain in Mbuni Mbuna. Umuti is is medicine. Umuti. Yes, we can keep we keep we can keep on ad lib. Uh, I think that we established something like two thousand correspondences. How much is it? Something like that. No, a lot, a lot. We have an old joke there in Namibia. Since you know Namibian languages, uh, yeah, you you send your your kitchen help to the uh, uh, to the. Kula outside and say, Kanali water. <laughs> now he comes back with a bottle and with a butter. He says, Now he's the butter. Is it the butter or is it the butter? Depending whether he's bamboo oil. Uh, see? <laughs> That's just a joke. I hope you allow me to make a joke. Right. We cannot stand here too long, otherwise, we won't finish. Okay. Because, as I say, you can do this ad infinitum with these languages. But you see, how you already recognize what is a Bantu language. Not just by the prefixes, I had added them deliberately, or she, or chi, that so-called class seven, which is used for languages, all right? But there you have the lexicon to get together. Um, okay, we've been at this. Now, you establish a common lexical stock, and from that, you can see, as you did already, you demonstrated it from your side, you can see which languages are related. And if I go back to that, this language certainly is not related. This one where byte is na and not duba and so on. And that is quick war from a totally different family. Nothing in common whatsoever, except for loan words. We come to those words. 
Now it was, this is the method in principle, all right, the comparative method. And this is where Westphal came in when um, Greenberg came up with his lumpy hypothesis of those four superfamilies, phyla, that comes from botany, the term, the stem, uh, four phyla for entire Africa. And where he said that there is no available proof in this form, lexical proof, where you can say by means of strictly linguistic data that you can, re that uh, you have a proto-lexicon for these languages. Here's just a quote of one of his papers, I, because it's so important and because it split the community of Khoisanists, I want to give it to, share it with you. We cannot as yet, this was an article in 63, he wrote several papers about this, but Greenberg never answered. We cannot as yet set up any sound shifts by means of which we can transcribe items in any one of these languages into items in any of the others. We've just done that with Bantu but he's talking about koi and san, koi and san together, no? Not koi on the one side and san on the other. We cannot therefore state that they, the koi san languages, have anything but borrowings in common. And it follows that, my read, we cannot say that they have genetic relationship. That was Westphal's stance, and with that he was the splitter who said, not one family koi san. Now, um, you've got the a bit, little bit of background about the methodology now. It's a very rigid method if you are disciplined and therefore very reliable. Mm -hmm. And it gives you cogent evidence. Uh, I now want to come to historic inferences which are based on the Khoi Khoi lexicon. I want to uh, focus on our languages now. I just want to repeat here, uh, okay, this first of all, there you have a genetic structure, a tree structure, to show that these languages are all um, related to one language, which we call the protocoy language, uh, where we can now reconstruct with a method possible forms. Fossen reconstructed something like 400 uh, etymological forms. So, uh, this is Khoi Khoi, that is the Namibian branch where only Khoi Khoi Govap lives at this stage. There is Namibian Khoi Khoi, and Korana, Khrikwa, and Cape Khoi belong to them as well, right? That is the main branch here. The other branch here, Fossen called the proto non Khoi Khoi branch, as opposition to that, but because that is a negative term, people now speak of proto Kalari Khoi. And there you have Western and Eastern. I talked about this in the first uh, 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 lecture here. Just remember this group here, Naro Pana. That is the Naro are there at Hansi in Botswana, the car central Botswana. I'll come back to this later on. Just see, it belongs to Kalahari Koi, the Western branch, okay? Um, now, um, just to refresh you and fill you in a little bit more on the gender system of Khoi Khoi remember the Khoi languages have gender. Uh, and as, let me call it a suffix here. It's, I say it's not a suffix, it's something else, but let's call it a suffix for this purpose. Feminine nouns have an S, for instance, the Khoi, the person, plus a feminine suffix means a woman. Uh, B for masculine, so koi plus a B gives you a man. Now here, okay, and then neuter, let me do that first. E, the hyphen means uh, the glottal stop as we say. It's not koi, but koi e. That means uh, a person, it's indefinite. It could be male or female, doesn't matter, therefore also someone, okay. Koi ge Is there anybody here who speaks koi before? <laughs> Oh, can't say it. Look about Munsi Tamadaha. Okay, uh, right. Um, now, here there is just a technical part, you might see it. If normally words in the stems end on a vowel, therefore you have S or B. When it comes to male, masculine ones, if they end on a consonant, and that would only be M or N in true Khoi words, 
then the B assimilates, it also becomes an M, and there's an E. So Ham is a lion. A male lion would be not Hamp, but Hami. If you go to Naro and so on, they would speak of Hampa. They keep the B, right? Uh, so remember that what I wanted to add here, the interesting thing is if you have non-animate objects, nouns, what, as, what gender do you assign? And in Koivogorov, it's fairly easy. In German, you have der, die, das, and you never know why is it der Mond, but die Sonne, feminine for the sun and, and, and masculine for the moon, which is smaller, should be bigger. Sorry, I'm chauvinist. <laughs> but what's they are chauvinist. Um, if a, an object is roundish, concentric, smallish perhaps, you make it feminine. You have, for instance, this R, uh, uh, which you can say is a kind of locality. Now, a feminine locality is something like a village or a town. If it is long, strong, big, you make it masculine. It's like R. So that locality, that long locality, is a river. Mm -hmm. Same stem, OK? You just change that suffix. And uh, it does not mean uh, biological gender now, but it has to do with the shape. For instance, you, uh, a house, a, a hut, and so on, is homs, feminine. If it's a big building like this, you make it masculine, and because it ends on a nasal, you don't say om, you say om me. Right? That is a big building. So this is the principle, something that you should perhaps also know when you look at words. Don't be confused by these suffixes, just look at stems. I just want to come back to the clicks. Mm -hmm. I've mentioned them that you have four basic clicks in Porto. Remember, Junto is something like 48. Porto only 20. That's a very moderate system. The first one is what we call the dental click. That's like your English. Come, da. Okay, you can all do it. Oh, shame. That's it. This one, the lateral click, that means your releases at the sides like you drive a horse. You can also do it, no problem. Then you come to the two more complicated ones, what is called the alveolar click, because the tip of the tongue touches on the teeth bridge. The important thing is it's a hollow sound because you flip your tongue backwards. And that gives, in other words, you have a large hollow cavity above the tongue when you release. That gives you the darker sound. My mouth is getting dry from speaking, so I'm going to click well now. This is what we call the palatal click. The issue is that you lower the tip of the tongue. So the first one is darker. The other one is lighter. And if you can't do the clicks at all, you just snap your fingers. <laughs> all right, so much about the clicks so that you can read it. Each click has got five variants. I don't go into the variants here. It takes too long. I can just demonstrate with one, let's say this one. So that four times five gives you 20, which is a very moder moderate system for a coil language. Right, now let's come to, from there, let's go to borrowing of clicks. And now we are in the history. How is it that we have these Bantu languages in Southern Africa that have clicks? Why do we say it's exclusive to Koi? Well, they have borrowed. And they could only borrow if there was contact, and preferably intermarriage. Usually the super straight society, the dominating society, uh, are the, the males of that society take a woman from the substrate society. They marry them. But the point is, children are usually raised in the mother tongue not the father tongue. So they learn the language of the mother that was adopted into the society. And this is how the cliques came into Kosa, Zulu, and all those languages. There are something like 11 languages, I think, in Southern Africa. Kosa, Zulu, Swazi, Puti, in other words, all the Guni languages. Uh, uh, Northern Debele also. Then the Sutu languages, Southern Sutu and Swana. Interestingly, Sepedi didn't have cliques until recently. It's only the town Sipedi, uh, like Joburg and so on, and they pick it up 
now from the Guni languages in their town um, pidgin that they speak there. Uh, Yei in Botswana has it, and uh, Bukushu and Kwangari in the Kavango and Tiriku, there you also have a click in the name. And uh, yes, those, those are the languages. Now, historically, that geographical expanse right up to the Kavango Botswana already indicates to you how far the Khoi and, and San, because the clicks would have come from San too. For instance, the idea of Esfalt held that the Nguli probably got the clicks from Khoi. The Sotu got the clicks from San. If you go to Nklokolo, for instance, at Tabo Busiu, I don't know whether you know those caves. The chief who built these caves, which were sort of sealed up like a swollen nest for security, he had a Bushman wife, and she wanted to live in these caves. That's why he did it. Anyway, um, so the, the languages could have come from either Khoi or Sotu. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the extent geographically how far they go, you have an idea how far the Khoi and San uh, area must have expanded before the Bantu came down from the north into that, uh, that uh, terrain. The Khoi were not and the San we're not just encroached upon here by the Dutch from the Cape. Right. Now, from this, we come to the issue of um, the pastoral mode of uh, uh, the pastoral economy. Um, the question is who got what from whom? Who got sheep from whom and who got? Cattle from whom and goats mainly. And who um, stole what? Sorry? Who stole what and from whom? Um, <laughs> now, according to archaeologists, the autochthonous late Stone Age population of Namibia, wherever they were, called them Bushmen or what, acquired sheep already or sheep breeding. Mm -hmm. uh, became acquainted with sheep breeding before they got cattle also. And sheep were found, evidence of sheep bones were found something like 1,500, if not 1,900 years before present wow. in certain caves in Namibia. Now you have similar figures from here, from Castilberg, there up north towards um, from Rainstorp and so on. The dates there that are traded are something like 1,600 to 1,800 years before present oh. for, for sheep, right? And uh, cattle only 1,300 before present at the same area, Castilba. Now, the Koiko word for sheep is who. Moose is a female sheep, of course, a ewe. A group would be a male sheep, okay? Now, you can see from these words, which are based on them, these are Bantu languages all, and they all have something, certainly that vowel U, and a, probably a vila sound, G, N, K, something like that. You can see that they are related. Here you have an, an immediate borrowing, even with the suffix S in closer from the All of these up to uh, Namibia. <coughs> Borrowed the word sheep. In other words, south of the Limpopo. So the assumption is that the Khoi had sheep first, and the Bantu got the sheep from the Khoi. And that, what, that last language, where is that from? Yay. Uh, Yay is in, spoken in Botswana also, sort of northern, north central Botswana. It's one of the languages that also has clicks. Okay? So for these, languages you can reconstruct common band gu for south of the Limpopo, that area, and also over to the west to Namibia, but it is not a proto bantu form, you know, that it's going back to the entire family. It is localized. That is for sheep. When you come to, oh, the time is running again. Uh, when you come to cattle, you have this, uh, these data are from Westphal originally, it seems that the word here that gave rise to these words in these Bantu languages is goma in Khoikhoi again. Goma is a cow, goma, uh, male 
uh, a, a bull or an ox, and there you have homo, homo and so on. Uh, here it is not, you cannot retrace it to a stem like Gombe and Mombe, that's what we have in Namibia, on Gombe, for Oshihirelo and so on. So probably there is a chance at least, Westwald says, the, the uh, Bantu got cattle also from the Khoikhoi. <coughs> Remember the Khoikhoi had these extreme numbers, thousands of head of cattle here in the Cape when the Dutch came. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, all right, let's, let me come to one more. That is the goat. This is interesting. So to body, that dot means o, it's not o. Body, buzi, imbuzi, buti, and so on are the words. So common bantu is reconstructed as budi. Koi koi, piris, is that the same word? Well, yes, you need a bit of uh, phonetics for that. Uh, the e is there, and the r is there, the alveolar sound. Now, this is a high vowel e. And U, they are where the tongue is raised high. And you actually have the form, Buris, here in Naro, and in uh, uh, Chukwe, that is a uh, Cesaro, a Bushman language, also so called Bushman language in Botswana, Puri. Now, I had one instance of Puri also in Sesfontein from an old room. I remember that. And it, I was very excited because that's the evidence that they got the word from the Bantu. Mm -hmm. And what's more, the uh, Tswana, the first Bandu they knew here, the Bakshapi, they speak of Bodhi, and the Khoi today is still called the Botswana, the Pirin. Um, Botswana is Pirin, who, who is a country. So um, that shows that the Khoi did not have goats, and if you go to comparative in, in uh, evidence in Bantu linguistics, it is traced, the goat is traced back to Cameroon. That was the first domestic animal that the, that the Bantu had. Not cattle, not sheep, but goats. And indeed, the first goat in the Cape was seen here only after Van Riebeck left. In 1661, March, they saw the first goat in the Cape. So there's your evidence. You see, this is different dif disciplines correlating each other. Okay, let me quickly give you some examples from Dutch. I must stop earlier today. Um, okay, somehow this is not, this is not the file that I saved last. But let me come to the word for, don't look at the bottom yet, look at the top just, for, uh, Trousers. It is Purukhoi in Kwekuko. And uh, now you can probably hear where it comes from. Purukhoi. Sounds like Afrikaans, Buruk. That's what I thought for years when we were making the dictionary. What I could not understand is why is it not just Buruki? Why is this Kwe? It, it does not mean person, that Kwe. Right? Well, until I, one day I realized, well, the if Burukhoi would be a long, would be long trousers. Burukhoi would be shorts, all right? Remember, long and short things. Now, if you talk about trousers in general, the plural would be Burukhoi. Well, there you have your Dutch plural, Bruken. That's where it comes from. This shows you historically, it's from the time before Cape Afrikaans developed. Mm -hmm. It was from the Dutch days that they saw these new attires. Yes. It took them, as we heard, some 150 years uh, to acquire them because it was a matter of finance mm -hmm. also. And I freely told you about this, this, um, this observation in the diaries of the Hanadenal missionaries. I can quickly read it to you if I may. <laughs> Uh, after in, in 1793, so some 140 years after Van Riebeck arrived, they said, this is a translation from German in the book. It looks quaint to see a crowd of people, most of whom wear nothing but sheepskins. Note please, sheepskins, not springbok skins. A few of the men wear trousers, for the rest they wear skins. But among the women, very few have clothes. 
If a woman wears clothes and there are several who have none, one can observe those wearing no clothes always walking behind the one with clothes in front. So they were ashamed. It was a matter of status to change to the European clothing. Okay, that is now the word for Puru Kwe. The Kwe explains that this was already adopted in Dutch times, not in later Afrikaans times. Same for Brokwitz. Uh, the same story, the Dutch plural is Roken. Who was Dutch speaking here? Me. You're Dutch speaking, okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> anyway, uh, maybe you can just say the word properly for us. Okay. Okay, but you hear the N. Yeah. And uh, for phonological structures, they make it all air again. I won't go into that now. You can just see here, for instance, a stem like that is not possible in Kwekwe. You don't start.